Hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, my name is Becky, I am a research manager here at Marketing Sciences Unlimited. Um, thanks so much for joining um, on one, our latest webinar. Um, you can catch quite a few now that we've done and they're all stored on our website um, if you want to have a look. Um, so I've got a little treat for you today. Um, so I'm joined here uh, by Danny Finley, who's our retail expert. Um, she's got over 20 years worth of experience um, working with some of the, the biggest brands and retailers. Um, and so he's going to talk to us today about uh, the future of retail um, and, and what innovations that we have in store for us. Um, so just before I hand over to her, um, just so that you know, if you do have any questions or anything um, as we go through or anything you want to ask Danny, um, you can do that using the questions tab um, that should be there uh, as you're watching the webinar. So if you type those in and then we'll go through those at the end. So thank you very much and enjoy. Thanks, Becky. Um, hi, everyone. Just to kind of manage expectations, um, I've been asked to come and talk about the future of retail, which is obviously quite a uh, large topic. I am not uh, a future predictor. If I was, I'd probably be on a desert island somewhere with my lottery winnings. But this is just my kind of humble opinions, if you like, around the way I see trends going in the future of retail and where they might, where they might be going. It's only my opinions, a lot of it. Um, some of it you might agree with, some of it you won't, but I think hopefully the idea is that it will get you thinking um, for your own brands, your own retailers, your own, your own thoughts and your own shopping experiences really in terms of what we might be doing in five or ten years from now. We hear a lot at the moment about linking together the online world and the physical world and I think what we're seeing more and more recently is more of the sort of online only retailers that have been really successful realising that they need to have some sort of high street presence. So we see Made, we see Not on the High Street .com, quite a lot of the other retailers having these kind of pop-up stores or, or specialist stores. And I think this has started to get people thinking in terms of we all thought everything was going towards online, online would be the future, and actually a question mark is being formed now in terms of do we need to bring some of it back? You know, is it enough to, for everything to go online? And my hope is that no, there will always be a need for physical stores. So again, another thing that people talk about is the future of retail is about online and stores working together, um, combining to meet customer needs. And a lot of businesses recently have been bringing together what were actually quite separate online and offline functions and, and recognizing that that's not really how shoppers live. Um, you know, a customer has a brand in mind, but they don't necessarily have an online and offline activity. The relationship is just with the brand as a whole. However, what I'm going to argue today is that I think we could actually be moving to a separation again, back to online and offline, but this time it will come from a much more joined up understanding at the, at the beginning. Um, so it will still be about very much the customer needs, but it will be about each individual product and how that product um, meets that customer need and whether that product offers a convenience or an experience. And I guess the best way of kind of talking through how I'm, how I'm seeing this is that, so in the 1990s, we had offline retailers at the time. Most of us just called them shops or stores. And then obviously the internet came along um, and we had inter internet uh, retailers and online retailers forming. Now, some of those formed on their own um, and some of them came off existing retailers, if you like, that already existed on the high streets or in supermarkets, etc. But what was quite common was that because of the technology involved, it needed tech people, and often these were just done completely separately. So the kind of people that you needed to set up a, a retail outlet in a street were not the same people, not those techie people that you needed, and so you had these kind of two separate offers, if you like, and, and businesses being run very separately. Then sort of across the 2000s, people were kind of saying, well, really, we need to bring these together. You know, the customer doesn't exist in one world or the others. And we see a lot of really good examples of, of uh, retailers who've done this quite successfully. Um, a lot of, sort of clothing manufacturers, people like Next, obviously the supermarkets, the grocery shopping. And we've got this kind of online and offline offer. However, for me, I think the future is almost like splitting back out, but from the same place, as I said before. So not trying to deliver everything in both channels. So I think some products are more suited to online and some I believe will still be needed in, in a physical environment. So it won't be that the retailer is on or offline, it will just be that the products are served in different ways. And I think in order to work out which of these products is best served by which channel, it's gonna become really important to listen to customers, 
there's loads more data out there. We're all hearing about all the big data that's being collected and how people will be able to kind of really start to refine that offer um, to the most appropriate channel. But what the key this time is that obviously it's coming from a joined up place in the first place. So we're not taking two very separate things and trying to squeeze them together as we did between the 1990s and 2000s. This time we have our kind of joined up offer and we're really kind of stretching it out and that will be the key to, to its success really. So in terms of today, I'm going to look at the kind of future as two separate um, halves, if you like. The first half is to look at sort of technological advances and how they bring the retailer closer to us in terms of what they know about us so that we can have exactly what we need and it will save us time. And this I'm going to call convenience. And then I'm going to look at the future of fast and slow, which is a, a sort of buzzword around at the moment where you know, it's about a polarity where customers can pick and choose. Sometimes we want things quickly, sometimes we want things slowly. But ultimately, if we've saved lots of time because we've had all this convenience offered to us, then we should be able to spend the time that we've got left having an actually quite an enjoyable experience and bringing us closer to those products that we actually haven't commoditized, those ones that we actually want to spend a lot of time with. So, as I say, in terms of predicting future technologies, I think... Um, none of these will be kind of really way out there and a lot of them are actually already in existence in our homes, on our phones um, and many of them we're using already for kind of entertainment or for fun. I think when we actually say we're going to bring that into retail and we're talking about people actually buying stuff and spending their own money and having their own fears about security and that kind of thing, this can sometimes slow down this process for retailers. So although the technology exists, doesn't mean we can actually just say, oh, that exists, let's just put it into the stores, because it often comes with a quite a big fear factor from customers. So it's not about what can be done. I think it's um, about using them in the right ways at the right time and using the right communications to ensure that they become a benefit for customers. So it's not something customers fear. Um, and I think bringing some of the best of the digital into the, into the physical world where possible. And I hope some of these will at least get you thinking. So the first one is kind of dehumanizing delivery. I think we know now customers are bought into the idea of delivery, but for many it's still inconvenient, unpredictable, um, and is still very reliant on, on human beings, if you like. Um, all the time, the lead times are getting shorter and shorter. You know, next you can deliver up until 10 o'clock at night, you still get it the next day. Um, and we do have click and collect, drop lockers, all those kind of things available. But we know the technology exists already to kind of go robot, if you like. And we know that there's a, a Starship Technologies, for example. They've linked up with a retailer to deliver groceries in London. Um, and, and all the kind of publications that they're putting out there are saying that's going very successfully. And they're also partnering with Just Eat um, since about July, because in Australia it's all been very successful in terms of pizza delivery, etc. So there is technology out there to, to, to do this. And I do believe that these will become commonplace in the future. Um, as with many of these predictions, we don't know how quickly they will come. And I think retailers have to be ready for them. And, and most of the big retailers are kind of quite reluctant to be the first to go. Often what happens is smaller retailers can kind of take this on and make a name for themselves by being, by being the first. And they've got less to, less to lose if it goes wrong. And I think, you know, I remember talking about self-service checkouts probably 10 years ago, um, and it was a good three years before they were launched in anything other than a few key stores because customers just didn't like them um, and there was lots of kind of kickback towards them. So it was just so important that, that they were, came in and they were right, and the more that we can learn from customers about the channels and how they like them and what they need to be done, the speed of the process in terms of getting these into the stores and getting these out there. So I've no doubt this will happen for certain products. Personalization, um, this has been something that's been really successful in the online platforms. So we all kind of know that we carry around our lives with us on our mobile phones and our devices. And to a degree, we've accepted that we trade, we're constantly trading information with retailers um, in, in exchange for convenience. So you get this kind of messages saying, oh, because you like this, you might also like this. Because you bought that, you might also suggest you might like to buy this. And actually now, when people send those messages to us, we're actually quite pleased. 
um, rather than scared or annoyed or feeling like somebody's watching down on us. I think the real challenge is for the in-store channel where perhaps that technology is already there. We can do that. We have GPS, we've got beacons, we've got all that stuff that's getting more and more accurate all the time. So it is possible to kind of deliver these messages to people. However, I think while customers accept this online where they've kind of given some information, I think in the physical world it still feels a little bit intrusive um, and customers haven't provided that information for you to kind of bombard them. So the advice to retailers here is just make sure this is done really carefully and with really good reasons for it. So if you can give good offers, good deals and really good information that's relevant, um, those pros will then um, outweigh the emotional cons of kind of having Big Brother watching us and it actually being a turn on. Uh, Pokemon Go has made augmented reality mainstream for us. Uh, again, this isn't something that's new, but I think there's massive potential in retail. And this is one of the areas where there's the most has been done um, for customers to see the practical benefits of being able to use this. For example, you know, being able to try on clothes or see how furniture fits in a room. And the value of the, uh, the uh, uh, augmented reality market by 2020 is estimated $150 billion. Um, and literally 200 million users by ne literally by next year. So there are already examples of this out there, and I think it's a, a way of kind of showing a very fun experiential benefit to people um, in terms of how we can use that technology. For example, this IKEA um, app that's out there, so you can kind of put the furniture in your room and see how it will look to scale. Um, you've got kind of uh, merchandisers who are able to kind of send through to their convenience stores or any stores to be honest um, this is what our merchandising will look like in your store so you can see how it fits where it will be the size of it and again where in the convenience sector where space is such a premium um, I think it's going to become really important for retailers to actually have a look and see what would, what's going to fit in terms of point of sale material in China they've actually managed to introduce virtual stores which don't actually exist there's nothing there um, but, but people can go and buy products from these supermarkets um, in a virtual reality and obviously where property is such a high premium in China it's a good experience for people to actually feel that they are actually buying and I think this whole thing about augmented reality there's this idea that we are still humans and I will come on to this later and we do still like to have something tangible anything that's too abstract um, is just not understood by us so actually being having something like augmented reality helps us to kind of feel that experience even when it's not actually there. 3D printing is another uh, technology that's said to kind of revolutionise every step of a product's journey. Um, there's no shipping, there's no delivery, you don't have to wait. You can change the product, you can adapt it, you can personalise it. It seems to be the ultimate convenience, if you like. Um, and again, we know that this is already possible, technically. I guess where we're stuck at the moment is in that kind of initial outlay to be able to purchase a 3D printer um, and that's going to become a barrier in terms of um, who can actually have this. So I think what will happen is we'll start to see sort of 3D printing shops, perhaps in shopping centres and things like that, um, as an interim measure for people to kind of go and collect things that can then be 3D printed. And believe it or not, even food doesn't escape this and, and the technology is out there to print food um, and, and sort of Stories are out there of articles around how you can print the coffee, the cup, the bagel, everything, um, which is kind of scary for me. It goes a bit beyond, but um, it's definitely out there and it's kind of a watch this space. And I think at the moment, this is probably still fun and experience based rather than convenience based and price will be a barrier. However, it's not that long ago for anybody who's kind of as old as me that we think when we used to kind of take photos on our cameras and we used to put them in the post and send them off and wait for the boots to wash them and you could get them done in you know a day in, on a machine that was the size of a lounge so it would have been very futuristic then to have thought that we could actually see the photo print it from our phones and have it in our house and edit it etc um so i think you know we have to kind of think back to where we were 10 years ago just to say what possibilities there are and finally, in terms of the, the things that, that are out there, if you like, um, the Internet of Things, again, another very used word. Um, the Internet will no longer be confined to our computers and smartphones. Basically, anything with an on-off button will be able to become connected to the Internet, and we believe that this is going to be the norm within the next five years. 
In fact, I think some recent research said that something like 92% of mass consumers expected to have an in-home connected device within the next three years. So that really is quite, quite close by. Um, Amazon Dash, the button there you can see on the washing machine, you know, the idea that actually you can, um, when you're running out of a particular wash powder or whatever, you can press the button while you're in the moment, it takes a second and it's going to automatically send a message to your uh, grocery order or wherever you order from to say, oh, I need to buy some more of that. Um, and I think as the retail industry gets more and more data than ever, there's going to be more and more ability to personalise this and offer more, even more convenience. So again, it's not tech for the sake of tech, it needs to be for the sake of the customer, it needs to make their life easier, more interesting or cheaper in some way. So really overall what we're saying is technology needs to make the process of shopping easier for customers, um, save them time, reduce their hassle. There are plenty of irritants out there, um, people who can't find products, looking for special offers, looking for advice, stock checkers, making payment easier queuing up, all that thing. There's all the opportunity there for technology to really, really work. But I think the message to retailers is don't introduce technology just because it exists. Um, yes, you can get a certain amount of fun. Yes, you can get a certain amount of experience. But really, the ones that will be very, very successful are those that actually solve a problem. So going back to my point before, is it convenience or is it experience? I think it's true to say that um, the savvy shopper has always existed. Um, they've been over the years savvy for price, savvy for value, um, suiting their own preferences and needs depending on, on that, what that might be. But I think that the future now witnesses customers who will be channel savvy and tech savvy. And by which I mean they'll know which channel to use to suit their needs and when to use the tech and when not to. So although the tech will be out there, the choice will be there, people will actually want to choose between the two options and obviously it's great to be able to order something at 10 o'clock at night and have it the next day or press a button on a washing machine and have your powder delivered to your house but that's only great if you don't want to have a connection with that product um, so it'll be great for repeat brand purchasing household goods and customers will be able to save time and money on these sorts of products and free up time to uh, spend buying products they want the other thing is the recent savviness that's come out in, in terms of quality and particularly for food um, has meant that there's this kind of received respons perceived responsibility for consumers to get closer to their food again. And I think this is going to be something really interesting to watch for in online delivery and which individual products and categories start to drop off those online grocery lists and that just aren't being bought online anymore. So... For me, the future for brands and retailers is to really understand how their individual items fit with customer needs and how customers want to buy them. So we've got all this big data out there. We've got more data than we've ever had. Let's find out how we can make it kind of suitable to the channels. And this, I think, will be at product level. I think retailers will allow you to buy a white T-shirt or a repeat pair of jeans online. But then if you want to buy a dress for a wedding or a suit where you need to take time from the same retailer, you might want to do that offline and I think people will need to see the slowdown when it's worth it you know they're going to want to enjoy and embrace that experience not everything can keep on being faster and faster and more and more remote whilst the te technology exists to do that we are still human beings and certainly I hope in my lifetime we'll still want to have connections with people and products and experiences and information will become important you know where did this apple come from who was it that made this cake and customers will start to trade time between products so they get fewer but more meaningful shopper experiences. And hopefully people will start to fall in love with shopping again as commodity shopping on the one hand becomes very automated and then we have the power to press pause and really live it for the products that we really want to. And I think the example we showed made right at the beginning shows that even when you're great online and have a great online offer, there is now recognition that you do still need to bring customers close to the products that matter to them. One example that I usually give is, is airport shopping. Um, I don't really need anything and I rarely have room in my luggage to put anything else in. But what I do have when I'm at an airport is time. And that's something, you know, I'm happy to spend that time walking around these shops. Um, I might or might not buy anything, but the experience itself is made to be pleasurable. And you can really remember what it's time, what it was like to have time to look at clothes, smell perfumes, try and make up, and if it's not too early, 
try the alcohol. Um, and these shops are really made to be luxurious and the experience is actually quite pleasant. And I think shopping in store in the future will be all about the experience. So retailers need to be brave and they need to improve that experience instead of fear that the in-store is dead. So let's face it, not many stores at the moment have a really great shopping experience because they are still very much about selling rather than experiencing. And if it was only about selling, I think you know it could be commoditized to online and all those technologies would take that away. So obviously there'll be a price a pricing model really that comes that needs to be taken into account here, that the brand want to be able to add a great experience to an online experience and not be afraid to charge for a good experience because otherwise it's just not going to work out. Do we think people will actually pay to have a good experience? Well, my view is that enough of them will. And my sort of final example really is the cinema. So even in today's price savvy world, um, cinemas are still existing. Um, despite many years ago with us saying they were dead. So basically prices in cinemas kept going up and up and up. DVDs came out quicker and quicker. And actually the cinema experience itself didn't really offer very much. So what did, what did cinemas do? Well, the good ones, uh, rather than kind of go away and die and give up, a little bit like blockbusters, said no, actually what we're going to do is we're going to invest more in the offer so the experience cannot be matched. So they put in surround sound, comfortable seats, luxury seats, the lighting, even better picture quality, even better sound quality, 3D, etc., etc. And then what started to happen was film viewers began to pay for that experience over and above the actual film itself. So out of context, the price of going to a cinema, as we all know, plus the food, plus everything else, is pretty high. But people are still visiting because they cannot replicate that experience at home. So for me, physical stores are not dead, and for those retailers who are brave with their investments and listen to their customers, there is a real opportunity to offer these experiences to customers which they cannot get or do not want to get online. So finally, you know, rather than looking at bringing together on and offline, for me it's much more about bringing together experience and convenience and matching products and customer needs to the right channel, and also being a bit brave. So at the end of the day, we are all still human beings, and I don't see why some shopping shouldn't be a great way to spend our leisure time. Thank you, and I hope that's got some of you thinking. Thank you very much, Annie. Um, well, it's certainly got me thinking. Mm -hmm. Loads of good stuff in there. Um, as mentioned, if you've got any questions, um, now is your chance to, to have them answered, so please do send them across. Um, I can see we've got a couple that have come through already. Um, so this first one from John, it looks like is oh, in reference to the Internet of Things um, that you mentioned and the sort of Amazon dash button. Okay. Um, so it seems to help um, manufacturers as you can only reorder one brand. Do you think customers will buy into this for convenience? Yeah, that, that, is a, that is a very good point, and I think that is the case at the moment. So most of these Amazon Dash buttons are linked to manufacturers. Um, so that one, I think, was an American, the Tide. Um, so yes, I think if you are very brand loyal, um, then obviously the convenience of this is um, absolutely fine. But I think what we are seeing in retail is fewer and fewer people are becoming brand loyal. Um, and we know that the own, li own label brands, for example, are um, really beginning to take over and brands are struggling. So this will be great for brands, but I imagine it will be for a short, uh, short space of time until somebody comes up with um, either, I, the way I see it is either one of two ways. So the brand itself could be really clever and offer the option to say, you can order this product from any retailer and we will find you the best price. So, for example, if it was um, Bold, um, Bold will do a check across Morrisons and Tesco's and Sainsbury's and say, this is the best offer, um, so we'll order it from the best offer department, that's if you're brand loyal. Obviously, if a retailer could come up with something and you could be loyal to the Tesco's and Sainsbury's and Morrisons of the world instead, and you could then say, I would want you to buy me one of these three and in fact, I think it's Tesco who have actually partnered up with a, with a tech agency called If This Then That, 
um, which is a sort of very computer savvy way of saying, you know, you can actually set rules. So I could actually set a rule to Tesco and say, please buy me bold or sir or personal in these acceptable fragrances in packs of more than 30 every time the price drops below 10 pounds of for example so you can actually set that rule and then what tesco's website will do with this kind of if this then that programming will um, buy those products for you when they become on those offers at the best possible price so i think that's quite exciting um, to think about those kind of things where putting the customer back in control of what what they will actually buy clever stuff um, and then so I've got um, another question here from Lucy um, so she says there has been talk in the news this week um, about electronic price edge labeling uh, in supermarkets um, do you have any thoughts about that Yes. Lucy, you're clearly right on the money there <laughs> keeping up to date with things yeah so I think that's only from a couple of days ago um, I think it was, if I'm right, I think it was uh, Tesco's who have been um, either taken to court or some legal action has come out because the price on the shelf was not actually the same as the price that was actually charged um, at the till. Um, Tesco's, believe it or not, even though, again, this is something that, as far as I'm aware, has been on the radar for about eight or nine years in terms of us being able to kind of tip, dip in and out of research looking at electronic um, labelling not really a benefit to customers as such i see this is much more of a benefit to retailers because obviously what it means is obviously they don't have the staff having to put all the uh, labels on the shelves they don't have the legal action of the labels being wrong and they are actually able to change the pricing up and down if they want to and even talk around sort of doing it different times of day different regions if things are um, lots of stock to be able to reduce the price so lots of benefits for the retailer I think for the consumer um, is probably less so. So it really is about the, the the retailers having the investment and having to pay out you know billions to get this into every one of their stores. But then once it's in there, I think it will probably be paying dividends to the retailer. But as I say, as yet to be seen for customers. Cool. Um, so I've got a question. One more question here from uh, Greta. Thank you. Uh, so which groceries are more likely to drop off the online shopping list um, and do you have any data from retailers to support this okay so in terms of data that we can share i think we don't have anything actually that we can share but what we do have is um some knowledge around online grocery um retailers which i can get yeah i can to, yeah. to put up somewhere um yeah that's a great question I think what we're noticing really is, is fresh. So it really is around um, fruit and veg, meat and poultry. Um, those are the key areas really in terms of customers, as I said before, getting closer to those products and really wanting to um, see them, feel them, touch them, um, rather than um, allow them to just be delivered online. And again, anything with a sell by date, although the retailers are getting better and better in terms of picking the items, um, there's still lots and lots of complaints about the, the shelf edge, um, sorry, the shelf life being um, too short. So it really is kind of those fresh products that will drop off. And the ones that are kind of bought, bought in bulk, the household goods, the pet foods, the things that don't change, where there's no real choice, those are the ones that will pretty much stay on the online online list. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I think we've just got one more question. Um, so which shopping trips uh, will be elevated for the ex uh, elevated to the experience that people will pay for so um and do you think the trip to the supermarket will be one of the, the one of the ones that survive so thinking about this okay that that is a good question um i think ultimately it can be any so i, I don't think the supermarket is out of the out of the possibilities of being an enjoyable trip I think going back to what I was literally just mm. saying in terms of the products, so it's actually about finding the right product. So what the supermarket might be is it might be might be smaller um, and it might be much more focused around fresh. So um, in my head, I'm, I'm thinking of sort of the US where they have a lot of smaller supermarkets, but they're very, very fresh dominated. Um, and their chemists are the ones that tend to sell all the kind of toilet rolls and household products so if i think about a very fresh grocery offer in a supermarket 
um, where the experience itself will be very interactive. So there's much more um, tastings and things like that, and bringing people uh, information, um, local activity, and it will be a kind of meeting hub really for people who care about their food. And that for me is, is kind of the, the way forward. So it's anything that's um, emotionally where the customer wants to have a connection. And I think the data that most retailers have on their products will probably start to tease out. And that's what I'm talking about. That's the teasing out between what's bought online and what's bought in store. And really that will define um, which shopping trips will be able to be elevated for experiences. But I do wonder if the, the kind of the day of the mass, mass extra hypermarket is over because nobody wants an experience that lasts three hours where 50% of it is buying commoditized goods. So I think it'll be much smaller, much more niche and much more focused on products rather than the whole range. It's, it's really interesting to say that because I feel like it's suggesting we're moving almost back to a time yeah. where they're much more diverse in terms yeah. of buying certain products from different places. Yeah, but I how we do so. that's changing. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, if you do have any questions at all um, that come to mind later or you want to ask um, Danny or myself any questions, uh, please do contact us. Um, so you can see Danny's email, email address on there now. Um, I will send out to everyone a, uh, a link to the recording of the webinar so that you can, you can download that and share it or listen to it again um, at any time. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Danny.